Hello, and welcome back to our webinar event, Israel-Palestine, a humanitarian case study. I trust you have been enjoying our presentation thus far and are eager to delve deeper into the topic ahead. Stay tuned for more insightful content provided by Dr. Carolina McLachlan. She is a senior advisor in policy and advocacy at the Center for Civilians in Conflict, where she leads the organization's work with NATO and the EU and supports civics country programs. She is currently planning a work stream on what protection of civilians looks like in large scale combat operations. Prior to joining CIVIC, she worked on addressing corruption in military operations and researched the use of corruption as a tool of hybrid warfare at Transparency International Defense and Security and was a policy analyst at the House of Commons Scrutiny Unit. She holds a PhD in War Studies from King's College London and a double Master of Arts in International Relations and American Studies from Warsaw University. Carolina, please share with us your perspective on key protection and the use of explosive weapons. Thank you very much, colleagues. First and foremost, can you hear me? It's good copy. Uh, okay, great. Now, um, thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you very much for putting this together. I think this is one of those conversations that uh, uh, we certainly should be having, even though, as you have noticed, it is not an easy one. Now, um, I'm going to try to add to uh, the points that my colleagues have already made by uh, focusing on two issues. Uh, one being the use of explosive weapons and especially the reverberating consequences thereof and what that means for uh, civilians in Gaza. And the second being what that means for military planning, what it does mean, what it should, should mean and what it perhaps, what, what perhaps we could be seeing that we're not seeing. Um, as has, has already been noted, uh, we're seeing a really quite a staggering death toll in Gaza right now. Um, we are seeing about 30,000 dead, about 12,500 of whom are children. About 70% of those are combined women and children. That means that even though we do not have um, a breakdown or a confirmed break breakdown of how many of those are fi fighters and how many of those are civilians, likelihood is that the great ma majority are civilians because the consequences of uh, the military operation, the consequences of the war, um, appear to be disproportionately affecting the groups that are, in any case, statistically much less relevant, uh, much less likely um, to be fighters. And therefore, we can, I think, say with a solid degree of con confidence um, that this is a conflict that disproportionately and very much affects civilians. Um, it is also one of the most intense conflicts of the 21st century. Um, our colleagues at Air Wars, which is a British NGO that uh, tracks civilian ca casualties and conflicts, um, recorded about a thousand of civilian harm incidents just in the first month of the campaign. Just to give you a comparison, uh, when they were tracking operation, uh, when they were tracking operations in Iraq from 2003. The most they ever recorded per month were 253 civilian harm incidents. That is a fourfold um, increase when you look at Gaza. Um, we have also seen just within the first couple of months of war, we have also seen hun hundreds of 2,000 pound bombs dropped. Um, these can cause harm within about a thousand feet radius. And about half of them were dumb bombs which also means that um, the ability to minimize civilian harm, uh, to prevent it from happening, um, was not perhaps as robust as it should, should have been. Now, the use of explosive weapons, especially uh, those with uh, a wide radius and within populated areas, is something that has been gaining more and more attention as um, an issue that tends to result in tends to result in dire consequences for civilians, and that tends to um, cause dire humanitarian consequences. Um, in 2022, more than 80 states signed um, the political declaration on explosive weapons in populated areas, uh, where 
they particularly paid attention to the co consequences of uh, their use in, in cities, uh, where they particularly paid attention to re reverberating effects, by which we mean second and third order effects that might not necessarily come directly from uh, military operations, but are nonetheless a result thereof in a slightly longer time time frame and where uh, they also paid attention to uh, the necessity of um, adapting military pla planning strategies and tactics to try and prevent or uh, respond to the consequences of the use of explosive weapons. And yet we see very little of that restraint in Gaza. Uh, we see um, a, a, a campaign that relies primarily on the use of explosive weapons and a campaign that is being being conducted among 2.3 million people, 75% of whom um, have now been displaced. It's also being being conducted in one of the most densely populated areas of the world, um, which and again comes with um, increased risks. Um, for the time being, the majority of the Casualties appear um, to have been caused by direct consequences of the use of, of explosive weapons. So we're talking here about deaths and injuries caused um, by ordnance being, being, being dropped. Um, there is an interesting study uh, that appeared very recently looking at um, you know, three possible scenarios um, from now projecting uh, six months ahead. Um, they looked at what the likely numbers would be in additional or excess deaths and injuries within the next six months, depending on how the scenario develops. They've concluded that if there is a ceasefire now, it is still about 6,500 people that are going to die within the next six months. If the campaign carries on as it is now, it's almost 60,000 that are likely to die. If there is an escalation, we're talking about 85,000 excess deaths within the next six months. Some of those um, will, of course, have to do with direct consequences of the use of, of explosive weapons. But an instructive point in this is also that even if there is a ceasefire now, Deaths will continue to happen. And this is where you see the significance of re reverberating effects. This is where you see the significance of, um, for example, damage to critical infrastructure, damage to water pipes, which um, has resulted in a shortage of uh, clean drinking wa water and a dire state of sanitation. Um, these numbers also, I should say, do not include a case where there might be an epidemic caused by damage to infrastructure and caused by a, a lack of provision of clean drinking water. If there is an epidemic, those numbers are going to be uh, much, much higher. These numbers also include um, causes of death such as uh, malnutrition, which is affecting right now one in six um, of Gaza's children. Um, they include things like increased maternal and infant mortality. Um, that can also be tracked to um, malnutrition, extreme stress, injuries, um, and a lack of medical and uh, and a lack of me medical care. At this point, as you might know, about two thirds hospital, two thirds of the hospitals in Gaza have been either completely destroyed uh, or damaged. And in the north uh, of the enclave, that is, I think, twenty out of twenty-two um, at this point. So. I think one of the one of the messages that I would like to leave you with is that the consequences of the use of explosive weapons carry on much, much longer after the bomb has been dropped and that it's not enough to look at the direct casualties caused by the conflict. If you do want to get a full picture, it is absolutely necessary to look also at what's go going to happen after after the bombs uh, stop falling. Um, in addition to the damage caused by, by explosive weapons, we also have uh, a crisis caused by 
a combination of displacement, which effectively means that more people are um, are now get, gathered in a much small, smaller area and relying on both infrastructure and food pro provision in that area, both of which are inadequate. That is compounded by um, a lack of access for humanitarian aid. Just to give you an illustration, before uh, the 7th of October, Gaza was receiving supplies um, numbering about 500 trucks. That was both, both um, commercial su supplies and aid supplies. Right now, on a good day, about 200 trucks are getting through. On a bad day, it's as few as 10. You can imagine that uh, food insecurity um, is, is becoming quite severe in the country. Um, we're also seeing um, impediments to humanitarian aid be, being, being provided, such as um, convoys being shelled or um, tar targeted. Um, within Palestine itself, we have seen over 160 humanitarian workers killed, and especially those from um, the UN's aid agency ANWA. Um, we've also seen ANWA being defunded by, by multiple donors due to um, the allegations that some of its staff were involved in uh, the 7th of October attack. Now, these allegations are extremely serious and they should, should be investigated and they are being investigated uh, by, by the UN system. But there is a question of whether defunding a whole organization that is the main provider of humanitarian aid um, in the re region um, is not a disproportionate reaction. Um, now, how does all of this feature in military planning? How should it feature in military planning? Um, you will, of course, be aware of uh, the provisions of international humanitarian law and the, the limits that it pl places on military action. Um, there are some practices, at least, that um, seem to have worked relatively well in pre previous conflicts, but it is much less clear that they would work here or there, there is a desire to, to make them work. I'm thinking, for example, about embedding um, offic officials from humanitarian organizations with the idea that was done uh, in 2006, during the, uh, the Israel-Lebanon war, uh, war, and seems to have deconflicted the provision of humanitarian assistance. Whether that is even a possibility right now, or whether anyone is willing to, to entertain this, um, is, is not um, clear to me. There is also a bigger question of whether the strategy and the set of tactics um, selected here was the only possible choice and whether it was the best possible choice given the civilian toll um, that these ta tactics are taking. Um, we can see this particularly now around um, the issue of Rafa and the, the offensive in Rafa that has been advertised uh, or I'm sorry, which has been announced. Um, it is again not, not clear to me what to say civic at large, um, what happens to civilians who have been displaced from the north of Gaza into Rafah? Because at this point, there is nowhere safe for them to go. If there is an escalation of fighting in Rafah, the civilians are likely to be even more affected than they have been now, and there is no safe place for them to go, as far as we can see. If the argument is that uh, hospitals have been used as shields for fighters and hospitals are targeted because of that. What does that mean for the obligation to provide some sort of an, an alternative med medical care? Um, we understood that some um, mobile cl clinics have been deployed, but it is also clear from the reports of you know, amputations being carried out without anesthesia and people dying from entirely preventable diseases because of, of lack of medication and lack of staff, that whatever is being provided instead of Gaza's hospitals is insufficient um, and it is not working. In the, on the long-term aspect of this operation, I would also ask whether the, this choice of strategy and this choice of tactics is actually going in the long term to make Israel safer which is the stated state goal of uh, the Israeli government. 
All in all, I would want to leave you with two thoughts. One is that the consequences of war and of the use of particularly explosive weapons in cities do not end when the bombs, when the bombs stop, stop falling. The second thought is that in civilian casualties in conflict, yes, to some degree, they, they will always be there, but the degree to which they happen, the numbers which we are see, seeing, are certainly not preordained. This is something that we can plan for. This is some, something that we can prevent, something that we can respond to. So there is also a question of how we choose military strategies, how we choose tactics to make sure that those trade-offs between military goals um, and protection of civilians and the safety of civilians uh, do not put the entirety of the price that needs to be paid for the war on civilians. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your engaging work, Carolina. Um, especially realizing uh, or listening to the numbers and facts you provided us with and the aftermath of explosive weapons is uh, still shocking and terrifying at the same time. Um, and I'm pretty sure that your two end thoughts or the thoughts you would leave us with uh, will uh, create a lot of questions in the aftermath of our discussion. So thank you very much. Um, we have explored now a wide range of perspectives so far with 